tough to say something truly profound on day two of a conference, but if nothing else, I'll give Chris a really warm intro. Uh, so she'll be covering the con stuff in a few minutes. Um, what I'd love to do is take about 10 minutes to give you guys a bit of a, our tale of woe, with some of the growing pains we went through um, building our customer success team. Uh, talk about some of the insights we uncovered and the process we went through, and then review a few of the changes that we made as a result. Um, a little bit about me, so uh, I run finance, legal HR side of things, and also the customer facing teams at Inside Square. Um, I'm sort of trying to raise uh, eight month old, uh, 24 month old, and uh, like 48 month old. Um, I joined Inside Square about three and a half years ago. We're based in Boston, and we're up to about 130 people today. Um, Inside Squared is sort of supercharged reporting for SMB. So uh, we do things like we'll ingest your Salesforce data, your uh, Zendesk data, Google Analytics, um, and report it back in sort of beautifully simple dashboards for CEOs, management teams, VPs of sales to give these really pretty powerful um, dashboards. Um, and uh, hopefully this kind of sketches a little bit of where we come from. Uh, I want to tell you the story of some of the challenges that we came up against in our growth from you know, a few dozen customers to now several hundred. Um, early days of the company, we were off to an awesome start. Um, everything was sort of firing in all cylinders, and uh, we felt really good about the growth rate, right? Triple digit growth. Um, it's easier on a small denominator. And um, we were really happy about how things were going, and customer success was very much an afterthought. Now, maybe a quick show of hands, how many of you have contracts that are sort of 12 month or longer? Okay, it's a decent percentage. Um, we were signing up customers that are 12 months, uh, on average, uh, some longer, none shorter, and that kind of gave us this awesome feeling of safety. We knew that sooner or later we'd have to figure out how to renew those customers, but maybe we had some time to work on it. And, um, some time turned into a lot of time and we kept feeling really positively and we sort of felt everything was stable and great and we didn't really think too hard around the storm that was coming. And we thought eventually uh, these 12 month contracts would start to come up for renewal but we, we had a good product, we had good usage and we felt like things were going to go decently well when we got there. Um, instead when the storm hit it was more like this. and. Uh, what we found was we were um, fairly unprepared for a lot of the challenges when we got those uh, big chunks of customers coming up for a renewal in their first cycle um, and subsequent cycles as well. And so we kind of had to have a bit of a come to Jesus moment where we had to really sit down and evaluate everything in the business, try to figure out um, how we got into this place and how we might be able to kind of come out the other side. So I want to share with you six findings, which were bits of the process that we went through to figure out how we should be structured differently and what are some of the keys that we learned during the course of it. So the first thing we kind of uncovered was, um, in some ways, churn is a little bit like uh, going to deliver a baby. Uh, one, it's extremely painful when it happens. Uh, and two, <laughs> The action that precedes it usually happened like 10 months before. You don't sit there on the you know, car ride to the hospital thinking like, God, how did we get here? Um, we found that in the early days, it was so easy and so natural to fight the fires that were closest to us because we had customers who were renewing next week or their contracts had actually expired two weeks ago and we hadn't buttoned things up. And it was way harder to think about, okay, how do we now get on the right cadence for customers we're signing today? Let's fight the fires that are near us. And the problem with that is obvious. It's so much harder to change somebody's behavior after they've been experiencing mediocre service for 10, 12 months of a contract than it is to start from scratch. And so it kind of uh, informed us that there are really two levers we should always be thinking about, two categories of actions those that will impact the renewal rates of our future customers, and those that might impact the renewal rates of customers that are now mature with us, that are you know, past six months um, since signing. And those are two very different categories of behaviors, and we had to really think about them differently. Uh, 
As part of the process, the first thing that we really wanted to do was break down what was the customer journey that they were taking with us. Right from first touch point all the way through to when we said, great, congratulations, you've renewed, what were all the steps along the way that the customer perceived with us? And that really helped us map out, okay, what are the types of activities we need to be performing as a company to make sure they're having a seamless experience? It's so easy to sit there and have a sort of company-centric view rather than a customer-centric view. You think, okay, great, we're gonna do onboarding, we're gonna have this welcome call and that welcome call, rather than try to view it from the lens of the customer. And once we mapped out the customer journey, the next thing we had to think about was, great, now how do we deploy our team against our customers. And this is an area where I think it's critical to really give some good thought to what your customers need from you. What does your solution demand in terms of an approach? Um, there's some great stuff out there written online. Uh, a company that rhymes with main site uh, has some good stuff on this. Um, but there are products that demand a sort of sales-oriented CSM. There are products that demand a support-oriented CSM. Um, really thinking through what the specific needs of your product and of your customers are is the most important step here. And once you figure that out, then instrumenting around that and saying, great, uh, customer success should have this parts of the puzzle as part of its mandate. Sales should own these parts of the conversation. And for us, um, it wasn't just about kind of thinking through what our customers wanted, but then also once we've done that self-assessment, it was about talking to other peers in other companies who had been through this part of the transition and had some experience. They knew what it was like for the CSM team to own upsells versus the sales team to own upsells. And giving us that context made it a little bit more helpful to then transition to the next phase. The next thing we learned was that it's really important to put the structures in place before the crisis hits rather than after. Um, all of you guys uh, have obviously some capabilities in selling your CFOs on the merits of investing in customer success because you're here. Um, we found that it was so easy just to wait until we had too many customers to overwhelm one account manager or one CSM before hiring the next one, before hiring the next one. And of course, you end up with a pretty efficient system, but you also end up with people constantly overwhelmed. And you don't feel the pain if you're on 12 month contracts. You don't feel that pain for another 12 months. You think that you're kind of cheating death, but ultimately it's going to hurt you. So investing ahead of the problem was really important and something we try to spend a lot of time thinking about today. And then the next thing that we've discovered was really key was getting a nice tight integration. So making sure that the data structures and systems we were using were tightly aligned. So for example, every customer that we have has a renewal opportunity in Salesforce with the sort of bulletproof dates that we know start and end. We know that all of our customers have that. We know that they won't slip through the cracks because we have those automatic triggers in place to get the data working and flowing out smoothly. It took us a while to get that nailed down, but it was incredibly helpful to know that we could rely on that information. Um, I, it's common to say about SaaS that one of the beauties of exponential growth is you get this exponential revenue growth, but you also get sort of exponential complexity. And so if you don't invest early to make sure that you've got your data structures nice and tightly aligned um, and feeding into things like Tatango, then you're gonna be in a world of hurt when you get later and later and keep kicking that can down the road. And then lastly, we found it was really important to make bad predictions. Uh, not every one of us is sort of blessed to have a data scientist on the team who's spending time running beautiful regression analyses. Um, there's a myriad of ways you could think about a customer's probability of renewing, but ultimately, don't wait for the perfect answer. Start making predictions based on your best hypotheses early, and know that you'll have to iterate on them over time, but don't not make the prediction because you don't have certainty about it. So I'm just gonna run quickly through some of the changes we made. Um, we started off with an account management team and a support team, monolithic groups. We broke that into a CSM team, so we basically took out uh, the upsell piece of their job. We added a training component, so instead of having people do the same pieces, we have somebody dedicated to that now. We tiered it into a sort of junior, mid, and high. And then we broke our monolithic support team into a break, fix, and uh, implementation team. 
And this kind of focus has really allowed us to drive much better behaviors. So the outcomes were definitely better set up now to get to those next levels of growth. Um, I'd like to say that things are sort of beautifully smooth sailing ahead and that uh, we've solved all of our problems. Uh, things are working really well now, but I guess my last parting thought is you've got to constantly keep your eyes open and be cognizant of how your own business model is changing because your customers aren't sitting still, your sales team definitely not sitting still, and every time there's a little tweak in how you're addressing new prospects, every time there's a new segment you open, you're going to have to rethink a lot of these structures. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Chris.